or might he go about find some inspiration for these words that they may not just be my words alone but through your spirit we may find meaning in scripture in tradition and in history and in the present in jesus name amen well um it's a really weird set of readings today because i chose a rather odd feast that happened during the week uh, and the feast was the ugandan martyrs now, it matters to communities like ours because Uganda is often in the news because of its virulent homophobia, uh, because of the attempt to bring in the death penalty uh, for homosexuality that was supported by certain uh, hardline fundamentalist American pastors whose words fell on stony ground in the US who decided they would go and prey upon the good people of Uganda uh, and encourage politicians heavily greased with lots and lots of money. It's useful, however, to look deeper into this story of, first of all, uh, the Ugandan martyrs, which happened in the 19th century, these uh, 40 pages of the king, King Mwanga, the king of what was then called Buganda, and what is happening now, and how we see the seeds of homophobia in the history uh, which we usually wrote ourselves. You know, these countries which we like to look down upon as being backward, as being vicious and being homophobic and sexist, usually if you look at the laws that make them vicious and homophobic and sexist, they were the product of European colonialism. They were the product of Western, including American, missionaries pouring into Africa in the 19th century and other parts of the world. Uh, and then colonial legacy, which left these uh, harsh laws on the books long after the colonial power had been sent packing. Well, there's a further detail here. The detail is uh, that we tend to look upon the figures of the past as if they're barbarians, and that we somehow are uniquely blessed and anointed by God, that we know where right and wrong lay, and everyone in the past is just a barbarian, a savage, that they're demonic, that they're brutish, and nothing that they said can be of any value at all. So if we find what we see from our own perspective, which is sometimes one of enlightenment, let's be honest, a flaw in a historical figure, we discount everything they ever said and everything they ever did without accepting that they were speaking from a place that was deeply embedded in the world that they lived in, not the world that we live in and that their ethics and their morality was relative. And once we've made a little progress, we are desperate to forget where we were just 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, because we want to divorce ourselves and say, we are different people than our ancestors who did those terrible things. We would never do things like that. We can't understand how people do things like that. So I've called this the tyranny of the future and ancient savages. Because we like to portray people from the ancient world, even from a few decades ago, as being little better than savages. But we also will come under that tyranny of the future, because future generations will probably look back upon us as savages, look back upon us as barbarians, look at some of the things that we take for granted, just like our ancestors took them for granted, and ask themselves, how could they do such terrible things? So we have to understand that we need to look a little deeply into our history and our background before we discount it. You know, if we look at those Old Testament figures and we struggle to understand how they did many of the things that they did, it's also useful to remember that we're looking back nearly 3,000 years sometimes. And we only have to look back to our grandparents' generation to find some equally staggering things that people thought were noble and right and the accepted order of things. We don't have to look back 3,000 years. So I'm going to look at poor old King Mwanga. That's King Mwanga there. Bizarrely, it's a German portrait. I don't know where that came from. But he was the Kabaka, the king of Buganda. Now, to think what the Kabaka was, you have to think of somebody like Caesar. You have to think of something like Genghis Khan or even King Henry VIII, somebody who saw themselves, uh, or the Tsar, Ivan the Terrible, somebody who saw themselves as an absolute monarch, an absolute leader.
that their will was the will of the state, the will of the nation, and frequently the will of the gods, the will of the divine powers. And that to all those people living at that time, there was remarkably little dissent. You go along with what your society tells you. Most people go along with what your society tells you. So we look back just at the history of the Second World War, and we think, well, how did all those millions of Germans go along with all that? Yeah. Everyone else did. Everyone else did. You'd been told things which it was more convenient to believe, and in fact, it was extremely inconvenient to not believe. You found yourself in a concentration camp or in front of a firing squad. Much easier just to believe what everyone else believed. Much easier. Keep your head down. Probably have a family. You're thinking about your wives, your husband, your children. Six years down the road, it's very easy to judge those people because we see the full enormity of what occurred. But we are probably participating in some things which are future people are going to look back upon us and think, well, how the hell did they let that happen? So we look at King Matisse. He was a Moana, rather. Matisse was his father. Um, and we see that there was a man who was uh, a medieval figure. He was from a pre-industrial society. He was from a society that believed that he had absolute power. He believed that he had absolute power. And he'd started seeing Western missionaries, particularly French and British, come into his country and start telling people that one, he didn't have absolute power, that the gods and the spirits he worshipped were evil demons, and that the way that they achieved salvation was by opposing him and the regime that he stood for. Now, in our context, we would find that just as challenging today as the people of Uganda found it 120, 150 years ago. We are no better at listening to those voices that come to us almost as if they're from the future and tell us that what we're doing is barbaric. Jesus was one of those voices that came to people almost as if he was dropped out of the future, dropped out of a way of understanding the world which was far ahead of his time. And you see how people responded to that revelation. You see how people treated him. Well, Moango was a man of his time. And he had 40 pages, and those pages were part of his harem. Now, unfortunately for Mwanga and for the pages, they were male pages. And he had male uh, members of his harem, and the missionaries were utterly horrified by this. They weren't particularly worried about concubines, they expected that, you know. Thousands of wives was acceptable, I mean, God knows, it's biblical. How many wives did Solomon have? How many wives did David have? How many concubines did they have? That was fine. But he had pages, and he fondled them in public when the missionaries were there. <laughs> they were a pilot. Well, you can imagine this dour Scottish missionary that turned up, sitting down there with a face like a smack bottom, watching the king, who he considered to be a savage, in the middle of his palace with these teenage boys draped all over him. Well, it didn't go down too well. The other group of missionaries that were there were the White Fathers, as they were called. Now, they were French Catholic priests, and they took just as dim a view of all this, but they also saw an opportunity. And the opportunity was, if they could demonize the king and the traditional habits of the king, this was a society which had no understanding of homosexuality as being wrong in any way. If they could demonize the king and say that there was some deep flaw with the king, then they could overturn the system, which gave them the opportunity to Christianize a nation as they saw it, their own Christianity, but more importantly, that that nation could then fall into the hands of the European powers. And of course, the White Fathers wanted it to be French, and the Dua Pofe Scottish missionary wanted it to be British. So a war started, and it was a war between three different groups. The Wa Franca, and they were the French, the white Inglés, they were the English, or rather the supporters of the English missionaries. And then there were the traditionalists, and they started this war, and they went at each other hammer and tongs, and eventually a guy called Frederick Lugard, who was a British resident there, who happened to have a Maxim gun, opened up with this machine gun and solved all the wars. No problem anymore. He had a machine gun. 
Christianity prevailed. The reason Uganda is Christian today is because Frederick Lugard had a machine gun. Not because the good people saw the wisdom of the way of Christ, but because they fought with each other and it was ended with a machine gun. And because they won, and because it became a colonial nation, Mwanga, who, by the way, uh, executed those 40 pages for not giving in to his demands, and they'd been put up to this by the missionaries and saying that their souls depended upon it, so they told them that you have to say no to the king's advances, otherwise you will burn everlastingly in hell. So they said no to the king's advances, and they burned in front of the palace instead. Now I'm telling you this, not because there are any clear moral lessons from it. There aren't. It is messy, it is turbulent, it's repulsive. And a lot of the Old Testament is messy, it's turbulent, and repulsive. A lot of the things which are being done in our name today are messy, turbulent, and repulsive. And this belief that we are in a band of light that travels across the face of history, and everything behind that band of light is barbarism and darkness, and every in front of it is darkness because we are ignorant of it, is fundamentally wrong. We are the same people we were a thousand years ago, and the future is of the same substance as the present. And unless we learn to make our peace with our past, we will never, ever make peace with the future. I am trying to see through the eyes of King Mwanga, not because I support a man who burned 40 years to death, but because unless we get the possibility, the capability into our heads of understanding whose actions are so far removed from our actions, whose concepts of life and death and spirituality are so different to ours, we will never have a hope of making peace with our brothers and sisters in the here and now. Because the temptation is to dismiss people as demons at the drop of a hat. As soon as they become uncomfortable to us, as soon as they do things which we want to disassociate ourselves, we just dismiss them as demons. It's not good enough. You know, under different circumstances, we can all do those things. I haven't burned 40 years in my front garden. <laughs> I didn't mean that thing. So, Moanga, ever since, has been used by the church in Uganda and also by foreigners to beat LGBT people over their head with. Uganda has become fanatical about homosexuality for the same reason that so for many years Greece was fanatically touchy about homosexuality because it was so heavily associated with it in the minds of the people of the surrounding countries. And therefore, uh, the modern people wanted to say in a very loud voice, we're not like that, we have nothing to do with that. So they overreact. How many times have we seen this? People have overreacted because they are frightened of what lies within. How many conservative politicians need to be arrested in bathrooms before we accept that it is a fear of self that motivates the most hatred? Yes. We cannot go through life scared of ourselves. And I'm afraid Mwanga is part of ourselves. I'm afraid that Solomon is part of ourselves. I'm afraid that Joshua and King David are part of ourselves, part of what it is to be human. We cannot dismiss them as other, otherwise we dismiss ourselves as other. There is a line in the hymn, To God Be the Glory, and it says, oh, where are we? <laughs> the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon received. We frequently don't believe our own propaganda, brothers and sisters. We do not believe this. We act as if it is not true. I talked last week about we act as if there is no God in so many of the things that we do. We act as if God does not exist when we're faced by death. We act as if this passage that the vilest offender who truly believes is not redeemable, that human beings are not redeemable, that there are people that we can look back on just with a few decades of hindsight and dismiss them as the whack of the devil and they will burn everlastingly, but we fail to realize that we thereby are dismissing ourselves and our brothers and our sisters. 
My grandparents fought in a war that was very questionable. My great-grandparents fought in wars that were questionable. People do very questionable things, especially when their societies tell them to do it. In the lifetime of most of the people here, we, many of the people in this room, uh, who identify as either a male homosexual, uh, occasionally as a lesbian, but especially as a male homosexual, were prescribed by law. The same laws which we now turn to to reassert our position and our view. Those laws told people that they were illegal, that they were only worthy of jail, that they were only worthy of being locked up in order to protect society from them. That they were so odious and so disgusting that the only response that society could have to them was to put them in jail. To keep them shuttered away from other people, from vulnerable people. And as that no longer applies to us, we radically embrace the same system of laws and approvals and disapprovals that once sent us to jail and blackmailed us and drove us to suicide. That still drives us to suicide. So why am I preaching this? I'm preaching this because I don't want the whole historical record of Christianity and the Jewish religion to be dismissed because we find it hard to get our head around some of the things that people did. This does not make them other, it doesn't make them evil and demonic, it does not mean that their teachings are meaningless in our lives, it means that they spoke from their context, we speak from our context, we can only truly be judged by God, and pray God that there for the grace of God go we. So the Ugandan martyrs will be celebrated all over the Catholic world uh, as this um, defeat of this evil by the forces of good. The forces of good that had a machine gun at the ready, by the grace of God. The forces of good that then uh, annexed the country and kept it until the 1960s. The forces of good that bled it dry for how many decades? The forces of good that paid the streets of London with its resources. The sources of good that were the Christian powers, which now claim uh, to have the virtuous works uh, when it comes to matters of personal morality in that nation. This is not a sermon that should make you feel comfortable. It doesn't make me feel comfortable at all. Uh, but we have to keep that at least in part of our minds, uh, lest we endlessly repeat that cycle of dismissal of everything we've done before, and we are never able to come to stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, but merely to kick them out of the way when we find ourselves in the same place. So I pray that whenever you read something in the newspaper or listen to it in television, uh, you see the face of King Moanga there, and you think, ah, there but for the grace of God go I, that in another context, in another society, our expectations of what was right and what was wrong will be completely different, and we will be judged by our peers as immoral, demonic, or evil. 